Okay, so far we've looked at uh, how a mass spectrometer works, and we've taken a look at the molecular ion and what happens with different isotopic distributions. So we've looked at the M plus one peak, the M plus two peak. Now let's take a look at fragmentation. Now we're gonna start off by taking a look at uh, something we've already looked at. We've looked at uh, bromobenzene, and we know that uh, when we knock an electron out using a beam of electrons, we get a radical cation. And we've already discussed the fact that we have our molecular ion here. And we have another peak here, which we is due to the molecular ion plus two because of the two different isotopes uh, for bromine. Uh, and the fact that uh, that pattern will be diagnostic, diagnostic of bromine because we see the two peaks just two mass units apart uh, in almost equal amounts. Uh, we talked about chlorine. But take a look at this one now. The base peak in this instance is at 77. Uh, it looks like it's at 78. Uh, that's, that's just poor graphics. It's at 77. And what does that do? Well, what happens to this molecular ion, which is somewhat unstable, it can fragment and it can give us a phenyl cation and a bromine atom. The bromine atom is also a radical and these typically fragment to give us a cation and a radical, the molecular ions. This is the molecular ions for most organic species. Uh, all organic species will fragment and give different products. Now, those products aren't necessarily random. Uh, in this instance, we know that this peak at 77 is due to this. We see other fragmentation occurring as well. Uh, it's less diagnostic. You'd have to be more of an expert to take a look at it. But this one is very predictable uh, at 77. Now what happens, how does that fragmentation occur? That fragmentation is going to be based on thermodynamics. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's really based on the strength of bonds uh, and how an unstable system can become more stable in this instance by fragmenting. So let's take a look at another species that's somewhat like this. This is bromine benzene. Let's take a look at something called benzyl bromide. Now the difference here is there's a CH2 group in between the phenyl and the bromine. That changes this molecule quite a bit. Take a look, here's our molecular ion peak right there due to the radical cation. And we see our M plus two peak uh, right here, indicative of bromine. But notice how much smaller this is relative to the base peak than was the case over here. For bromobenzene, the molecular ion peak was almost the same size as the base peak. In this instance, the molecular ion peak is very much smaller than the base peak. That must be due to more fragmentation occurring uh, in our molecular ion species. So our molecular, our molecular ion in this case can fragment and it can fragment to give us Now you'll notice if the bromine stuck around, we would see that pattern. We would see the same pattern again in the fragments where the bromine is, is still attached. But in this instance, the bromine is not attached. So it fragments to give us our bromine atom and this thing, which is a benzyl cation. As it turns out, benzyl cations are much more stable than phenyl cations, relatively speaking. Benzyl is more stable because that charge can be delocalized into the ring. We'll be talking about that, uh, but it is that stability that causes more cleavage of the carbon-bromine bond and we get much less of the molecular ion and much more of the fragment. So let's take a look at some of these 
fragmentation reactions and how we can use it to diagnose uh, whether we think we have the correct structure uh, and we can confirm our structures using mass spec. So let's take a look at something simple, uh, ethyl iodide. Organic iodide compounds have uh, very similar things that we see in the mass spec. One of the things we see in the mass spec of organoiodine compounds is a peak at 127. When we form our molecular ion species, it can fragment to give us an ethyl radical and an iodine cation. Remember that the mass spec only sees cations. It does not see neutral species because they won't get deflected by the magnetic field. So we only see this. So what's this thing at 29? That's the mass of an ethyl radical, but this species can also fragment to give us an ethyl cation and an iodine atom, which is a radical species. This can fragment in both ways, and we see both of these. We see the peak at 29 for the ethyl radical, and we see the peak at 127 for the iodine cation. I'm sorry, we see the peak at 29 for the ethyl cation. Okay, in iodo organic species, we often see a peak at M minus 127 due to loss of uh, the iodine atom. And again, we see a peak at 127 because it can cleave the other way as well. Now, the relative size of these two things is going to depend uh, on the thermodynamics for that bond cleavage, which way the electrons go. What about organofluorine compounds? Organofluorine compounds, if we think we have fluorine in our molecule, what we want to look for is an M minus 19 peak. 19 is the mass of a fluorine atom. And quite often, these will fragment to, uh, the molecular ion will fragment to give us an M minus 19 peak. And for both of these species, notice that they're slightly different. We have three fluorines on one carbon and one fluorine on the other on this species. And on this one, we have two fluorines on each of the carbon atoms. Uh, but both of these give us an M minus 19 peak. We see the molecular ion, both of them, 102. Uh, these are isomers of each other. And we also see M minus 19. There is different fragmentation that occurs, though, because both of these will fragment by breaking the carbon-carbon bond. And we can see both sides of this. In this instance, the carbon-carbon bond will fragment to give us a CF2H radical and a CF2H cation. And we see that at 51. Nineteen for each of the fluorines, twelve for the carbon, and one for the hydrogen adds up to 51, and we see that peak. Now, over here, the 51 peak is small, and we see things at 69 and 33. When this cleaves, we could get a CF3 radical and a CFH2 cation. This has a mass of 33, and we see it right here. Now, what do we... They, it can also break to give us the CF3 cation and the CFH2 radical. And this cation has a mass at 69. This is a less stable cation. We expect to see less of this cation than this cation, and that's what we see. We see much more of the peak at 33 than the peak at 39. Now, it's very likely that these compounds are contaminated with the other isomers, and that's what happens why we see this peak at 51 and this peak at 33, and we do see a tiny little peak at 69. Uh, but the important thing is we see a very large peak at the M-19 for these species. So it's nice that all of the halogens have some diagnostic uh, 
things that happen in the mass spec. Remember for chlorine and bromine, we have that isotopic distribution. For iodine, we see a large peak at 127, and we see another large peak at M minus 19, or I'm sorry, M minus 27, 127. And for fluorine, we see large M minus 19 peak. It's hard to come up with organic fragments that would weigh 19. We often see uh, M minus 15 for loss of a methyl group, uh, but M minus 19 is pretty indicative of a fluorine compound. Uh, recall that we took a look at the fragmentation of hexane, so we can break our hexane bond in different ways. Uh, we can We can cleave it here, in which case we will expect to see a propyl radical and a propyl cation. And as it turns out, that is exactly what we see. We see it right here. There's fragmentation of the center bond. That gives us the base peak for this, uh, oops, sorry. That gives us this peak right here at 43. Uh, and we also see a base peak at 157, and that is due to this fragmentation. Notice when we fragment to form the ethyl cation, or I'm sorry, the ethyl radical, we get the butyl cation. That can occur by cleavage of either of these two bonds. Uh, these two we expect to happen in similar amounts, but we get slightly more because statistically, we can get cleavage in two different places to give this. So that's probably why we see the base peak at 57. The thermodynamics for these two uh, processes should be pretty similar, but statistically there's a greater chance of it happening uh, here. And that's why we see the base peak at 57. Now, the peak at 29 gives us, let's just change that. I'm going to use yellow. This peak at 29 is the, due to the ethyl radical and a butyl, uh, butyl radical and an ethyl cation. And we see uh, that in smaller amounts. Uh, and finally, our M minus 15 peak is right here at 71. So we see all of these different fragmentations. When a molecular ion fragments, okay, it will yield a neutral radical. And remember, we do not see the neutral radical because we only see charged species. And a cation. For organic compounds, it is very often a carbocation. Uh, we've already seen, though, in an organoiodine compound that we actually get an iodine cation as well. It doesn't have to be a carbocation. The mass spec will see any cations that are formed, but we often see carbocations. They're detected. The fragmentation will be dictated by the thermodynamics of the reaction. It's most often we think about the stability of the carbocation, but we can't forget that we also have to take a look at the stability of the radical as well. And that can be seen in this instance for the fragmentation of 2-methylbutane. We form the radical cation, and it can fragment in two different ways to form secondary cations. So it can fragment to knock off a methyl radical, and we get the secondary butyl cation. It can also fragment to give us an ethyl radical and this secondary propyl cation. Okay, so what we're really looking at is fragmentation of uh, either this bond. I don't know if you can see that yellow. I'll just keep going. In. That will give us a methyl radical and the sec butyl cation. Or we can fragment this bond to give us an ethyl radical and the secondary uh, propyl cation. Because the methyl radical is less stable than the ethyl radical, we expect this to be a larger peak. Uh, 
because the thermodynamics for this pathway should be more favorable. We don't expect a big difference in the stability of those two cations, but we do expect a, a significant difference in the stability of these radicals. So the formation of the more stable radicals should dominate. And if we take a look at the mass spec, we do see that the M minus 29 peak is much bigger than the M minus 15 peak, which coincides with the analysis we just had. Now, there is a way to form a tertiary carbocation, and that's by cleaving off a hydrogen atom and forming a tertiary cation and a hydrogen atom. And we do indeed see a large M minus one peak. I'm sorry, it's not a large M minus one peak. It's relatively small compared to those other fragmentations. Even though this is a very stable cation, the problem is that the formation of the hydrogen atom is very unlikely. So in this instance, we don't see the most stable possible cation uh, as our base peak. If, however, we had another methyl group there, we might see a lot of, uh, if instead we had a methyl group right here, another methyl group, we would probably see the formation of one of those tertiary cations. Different functional groups cause different types of fragmentation. We might expect fragmentation of this carbon oxygen bond to form our secondary propyl radical and the oxygen centered radical. Uh, we do indeed see some of that, but it's, it's, it's probably not that significant. Uh, although we do see a lot of the 43 peak in both instances. In both instances, we should see 43 peak. And notice that here we also see a large 57 peak as well as here. Uh, but look at the difference. How do these two differ? Well, notice these two spectra have, one has a one o, large peak at 101, another one has a large peak at 87. How can we attribute this fragmentation to these different ether groups? As it turns out, ether groups, like the fragment, I'm just going to expand this, they like to fragment in such a way that they cleave the bond uh, that forms a carbocationic center next to the oxygen. So if we cleave this bond, we should see an M minus 15 fragment, which we do see right there, as well as uh, potentially another fragmentation. Oops. Oh, here we go, over here, uh, which is going to be our M minus 43 fragment. We see both of those. We also see on this one that we can get fragmentation to form uh, the species over here, which is going to be 73 as well. That's M minus 43, and that's due to cleavage to lose this to give that fragment. And we can also see a large M minus 19 fragment. Notice now all of these, we can uh, see different uh, cations where we form a cation next to that oxygen group. This is very typical of ethers. So these are under their corresponding mass spectra. So this particular one, uh, we see a large M minus 15 peak, and we don't see a large M minus 15 peak over here. To see a large M minus 15 peak, it would have to cleave off either this end or this end, and we don't see it. But we do see a large uh, peak at 87, which is cleavage of this bond here to lose the methyl radical. So that's our M minus 29 peak. That's typical of ethers. So what we're going to see in the rest of the class as we introduce new functional groups, we're going to take a look at the different fragmentation patterns that occur. So I just want to go over a few functional groups that you covered in 
uh, organic one so that we can justify them. So one of the things that you covered was alcohols. What we see here, this just tells us the degree of fragmentation of the molecular ions for the different functional groups. Aromatic compounds tend to be quite stable and we don't see a lot of fragmentation. We see a lot of the molecular ion. Now that's gonna depend what's on there. We've already seen the instance of, of bromine fragments quite a bit. Uh, chlorine fragments less so because it's a stronger bond. The carbon's chlorine bond stronger than the carbon bromine bond. Alkenes don't fragment a lot. Uh, ketones begin to fragment a lot. We're going to be looking at ketones as well as esters and carboxylic acids as we go through this course. But you've already covered ethers and alcohols, hydrocarbons. Those all fragment a lot. So let's take a look at an alcohol. Alcohols also fragment in such a way that they form a cation next to the oxygen center. The reason for that is we can draw a significant resonance contributor that has uh, a full octet of electrons on the carbon uh, so that this is a stable resonance structure. That carbocation is more stable than we might expect than if that was not a hydroxyl group. So we can draw this resonance structure by moving this pair of electrons uh, to form the carbon-oxygen double bond, in which case we then have a formal positive charge in the oxygen. So we see a lot of this fragmentation. The other thing we see in alcohols, if we have a hydrogen that's on the carbon next to the carbon containing the hydroxyl group, we can split off a molecule of water and form a stable alkenal radical cation. So we see a large M-18 fragment. So we see a lot of what we call alpha cleavage and a lot of dehydration in alcohols. And if we take a look, uh, there's another thing that happens quite often for primary carbocat, I'm sorry, for primary alcohols, we often split off the terminal uh, CH2OH fragment and that gives us a cation at 31. So we expect to see a large peak at 31. And we can also get a rearrangement if we push our electrons like this to form an M minus 46 peak. So what we're looking for in alcohols is an M minus 18 peak and alpha cleavage. If we have a primary alcohol, we expect to see a large peak at 31. Uh, and if we have a long primary alcohol, we expect to see a large peak at 46. And in fact, if we take a look at hexanol, we see all of these things. There's the M minus 18, there's the M minus 46, there's the 31, okay? And that's due to the alpha cleavage right there. Amines also undergo an alpha cleavage reaction because we get a positive charge uh, next to a heteroatom with a lone pair of electrons so that we can draw resonance structures where that lone pair of electrons resides between the carbon and the nitrogen and our positive charge resides on the nitrogen and this thing obeys the octet rule. This one carbon does not obey the octet rule. This is a significant resonance contributor so we expect to see a lot of uh, alpha cleavage in amines as well. We're going to learn more about the McClafferty arrangement as we go forward, so you can ignore that for right now, but you can see we push our lot of arrows to form a, a rearrangement that occurs that gives us, uh, again, a species that is very diagnostic for carbonyl compounds. So the mass spec of amines, we expect to see this alpha cleavage reaction. If we have a primary amine, we expect to see a large peak at 30. This is very similar to the peak we see for 31 uh, in primary alcohols. If we have other amines, so in this instance, we see this thing. If we had this same uh, alcohol, but it was... dimethyl amine at the end, we would expect to see a large peak in this instance at 58. 
because we have three CH2 groups on there, or two CH3s and a CH2 group on there, we get this large peak at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is from this compound. This is the mass spec for this compound. We would expect to see this large peak at 58 for this one as well. Okay, so that's predictable uh, once we know the patterns for amines. Again, I want to remind you, this is from uh, last semester. You saw a lot of curly arrows in the reactions. want to remind you that when we do a pair of electrons, we always use these double-sided arrows. Double-sided arrows indicate the flow of a pair of electrons. When we're moving single electrons, as in radical reactions, we use these fish hook arrows or single-sided arrows to indicate movement of just one electron. When we look at uh, solving the structure of a molecule, we use many pieces of information. So you've already been exposed to IR last semester. This semester we're looking at mass spec. We're also going to look at NMR, but we use multiple spectra to come up with a solution for the structure of our organic species. So that's it uh, for this video. And that pretty well covers mass spec, otherwise to do some problems. Uh, one of the things you'll want to do as you look at these things and try to solve them, if you think you have the solution, you can look up and try and find on the internet your proposed structure. If you just put into the Google SDBS, the first hit that you will get will take you to this website. It's a very good website and you get uh, you should try it. You'll get lots of different compounds and you can take a look at mass spec, IR, Raman ESR we're not going to cover, but we're going to look at C13 and H13 NMR. So if you think you've solved the structure, you can go on this website and it's very likely you'll find that compound there and you can confirm if you made the right structure determination. Lastly, uh, we'll cover NMR in our next videos. Thank you.